Inflation is the miracle worker. Why do people eat cocktail when inflation is a problem? It's the solution, and it does one more thing. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Neil Howe. Neil Howe is an American author and consultant. He is best known for his work with William Strauss on social generations regarding a theorized generational cycle in American history. In this video, Neil Howe talks about the four turning cycles, the 80 to 90 years social upheaval cycle, and predicts the potential of economic and financial revolution. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. The Federal Reserve played a major role in moving markets in 2022, driving a campaign of monetary tightening as it tried to combat inflation at multi-decade highs. Fed officials and economists expect rates to stay high next year, with reductions unlikely until 2024. Next year, I think it's not going to be the Fed determining the market. I think it's going to be companies, fundamentals, companies that can grow earnings, defend their margins, probably move higher, Armstrong told CNBC's Squawk Box Europe on Friday. So if you go back and look during the American colonial era, we had what was known as the, uh, the Glorious Revolution in Britain, and it was an enormous period of, of uh, uh, upheaval. Uh, the American colonies actually uh, uh, participated in that revolution, which is sort of the birth of parliamentary democracy in Britain. It was also the birth of a new colonial system in America right around the 1690s or early 1700s. And then of course we have the American Revolution, which was about you know, 80, 90 years later. And then we had the American Civil War, right? Another long human life. And then we had World War II and the New Deal, right? Another long human life, right? Another 80 to 90 years. And, um, and guess what, Adam? There we are today again, right? <laughs> We're at that interval, right? We also noticed that roughly halfway in between these great civic upheavals, which, which occur in our outer world, right? In, in the world of, of politics, the economy, infrastructure, um, you know, the, the big public world. Uh, we have these intervals roughly halfway in between of what we call the great awakenings of American history. These are the, these are the cultural revolutions, you might say. And we actually name them in American history. We talk about the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the third great, and many, many uh, social historians call the, the consciousness revolution of the late 60s and 70s, America's you know, fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on when you want you uh, start to count. And all of these, this rhythm, right, uh, is associated with the coming of age of a different kind of generation. Right, and and we call them we give them archetypal names. So you think about um, first of all the rhythm of of these eras themselves. We call each era, which lasts about a length of a generation, we call it turning. Okay, so that gives the the title of the book. You know, the fourth turning. So each one of these long human lifetime spans can be divided into about you know twenty to twenty five year periods about the length of what we colloquially call a generation. You, know, you think about you know, once in a generation, you're thinking about a length of time about that long. And, uh, and there are four different turnings, right? There is the turning of the, of the post-crisis era. This is, uh, we call that the first turning. Uh, and, and we also call it a high, like the American high. You remember after World War II, this would be the presidencies of, of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy a period of great collective confidence, um, uh, not much individuality, not much a lot of cultural creativity, but America felt like it was more than the sum of its parts. Uh, social disorder was certainly at a very low ebb during that time in general. I mean, record low, you know, crime rates, for example, murder rates. You know, we had, we had uh, a lot of uh, social discipline uh, and, and a great sense of collective cohesion. Um, then, of course, we, that was followed by the second turning, and this always happens the same way in every cycle, right? The second turning was the consciousness revolution. Anyone who remembers the late 60s and 70s, a lot of Xers out there in the audience remember that as kids, right? So they remember that as family breakup and, you know, Judy Bloom books and you know, just all the, all the chaos and dysfunction of that era. 
And that was typical. That's typical of an awakening era. Uh, this is a time of, of rampant idealism, reform, utopianism, self-discovery, the whole emphasis now on self, right? And a certain indivi new individualism breaks out, a new kind of fragmenting of the old social consensus. Um, and uh, in, in the 60s, it started out really as more of a cultural revolution on college campuses, but it ended up really as more of an economic revolution. You think of the tax revolt and deregulation, right? As you moved into the Reagan's morning in America, we were a newly individualized society. We become more lightly governed. We were comfortable, right? In a, in a, in a, less, um, a less regimented order, you know, let everyone just be free to do whatever they want. Different strokes for different folks, right? I mean, and then, of course, you had a new generation coming of age. The generation that came of age during the awakening was boomers, and we call that the profit archetype, right? Uh, and they have a distinctive life cycle. The generation coming of age in this post-awakening era is uh, Generation X, right? Uh, so they, they, they saw the awakening as kids, and they were young adults during the, during the third turning, right? And that's the, that's the turning that comes after. We call that an unraveling. And most recently, that would have been the period really starting from the early 80s to the late 2000s. So we dated kind of 1984, morning in America with Reagan, to the GFC, right? The 2008-2009 the crash, which really brought an end, you know, to the... Um, to the uh, 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 you know, the movable feasts and all the celebrity, you know, uh, uh, culture and celebration and, uh, and the, the uh, political participation is hugely risen, right? Everyone knows that politics is really important now. I think that's a real difference between the 1990s, you know, the Clinton era and the GW Bush era, when everyone just tuned out on politics, you know, none of it matters. Uh, investors don't have to care about what Congress is doing or, or, or the president is doing. I'm telling you, Adam, now they got to care because <laughs> what's coming out of Washington, not just the Fed. I mean, the, you know, the, the markets have always said, you know, you can't, you know, you, you know, never fight the Fed. Right. So, so that has always been taken for granted. Uh, but now it's Congress. Now it's going to be presidential elections. Now it's going to be fundamental issues of, of power, top down change that could come very quickly, particularly as America increasingly feels that everything is out of control and we really need to move toward more radical solutions. I, I do find it very interesting that both parties are kind of drifting toward their, toward their populist fringes, right? You see the populace really running the show now uh, and among the Democrats, boomers, you can never get, you know, the old expression herding cats, right? It was always true about boomers, even when they were young. And they were always defiant and they were always raging against authority. One thing that's amazing about millennials, they're never defiant. They never rage against authority. I mean, it's very hard to see it. I mean, they're living with their parents at an unprecedented rate. Uh, and they are generally very close to older generations on a personal level. Now, I think millennials do have a big agenda. They have some big differences with their parents about how the overall rewards of the system are being handed out, right? Uh, namely, that liberal democracy no longer works for them. I mean, Absolutely. it's all biased toward older people. Now it's all biased toward market incumbents. I mean, let's face it, right? It's all piled up toward the silent and the boomers today. The millennial problem with boomers is just the opposite, right? Boomers can't run anything. They can't exercise authority. They can't invest in anything. They can't do anything for the long term, right? They don't know how to run the system at all. And this is why I say that the fundamental problem in an awakening is that the public senses that institutions are supplying too much order. But the fundamental problem of a crisis, the fourth turning, is that the public, be, particularly the younger public, begins to sense that institutions aren't supplying enough order. And that is always the context for a crisis, right? What that means is that the only way this can be rectified ultimately going down the road, and it will, you know, it all depends on the speed at which this happens, depends a, bit, a little bit on Congress, but it will be inflation and inflation expectations. So I, I, I really do believe that this is how it's going to play out. 
ultimately, of course, inflation, you have to you remember, particularly when inflation expectations begins to accelerate, puts an end to everything, right? The Fed has to change course. And even the MMT theorists are great. Yeah, once you get, you know, accelerating inflation, you have to stop the whole credit creation factory, right? So the Fed is going to have to start, you know, reversing quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. It's going to have to then start raising the front end. And then, of course, the back end will rise as, 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 as bond yields rise. But, but, but then what's going to happen is that's going to not only will you have a higher discount rate, which will pull down the valuations of the equities, but also it will tend to deflate and make collapse all the debt pyramids which underlie a lot of the investing in equities, right? So all those buybacks, all those borrow to invest schemes that everyone has, all that's going to be, you know, going, right? And then finally, and this is the killer. This is what I think people don't realize. Fiscal policy will be unable to neutralize. And I think that's what people don't understand. Now, you remember back in, um, back the last time this happened with Volcker, right? Volcker suddenly said, we got to get rid of inflation. We're going to just stop the growth in the money supply. I'm going to let the, you know, well, he let it. That's when it reached its record, right? 15.8%. Right. That's because he wasn't going to accommodate this. And what was the only way to present a real disaster to the economy? Reagan ran huge deficits, right? You remember, that was the policy. Monetary tightening, fiscal easing. This is what scares me, Adam, is that in this coming era, once you get those expectations of yields going way up, particularly in the out years, Congress won't be able to do that. You know why? Because never before in history have the uh, deficit projections depended so critically on low interest rate assumptions. That's the way we've always done it in the past, right? Inflation is the miracle worker. Why do people leave counting that inflation is a problem? It's the solution. And it does one more thing. It brings down the Gini coefficient. It helps solve inequality. And uh, remember, you know, inflation takes away from creditors. It gives to debtors. When you look at the huge growing equality of that whole Great Depression, World War II era, right? And particularly went through the American high, right? And huge uh, decrease in inequality in America. Most of it really didn't occur much during the 1930s, interestingly enough. It started right around 1940, and particularly in World War II and the Korean War and after that. Why? Financial repression plus inflation. The Treasury yield was stuck, right? The, the Fed and the, and the Treasury conspired to keep it stuck at no higher than about 2.25, 2.5 maybe at the highest. Inflation was racing into the double digits. And we had price controls. We don't, we don't know really what inflation was actually doing. But creditors were getting killed, right, for 20 years. That was when inequality went down in America. That's when the middle class came back. And, and the, if you look at the Gini coefficient, it reached its all-time low in the late 70s. That was after stagflation, right? We killed creditors. We killed investors. And it was right around that, the late 70s, right, when we entered the new regime. And this is what I would just remind people of, that inflation, so, and by the way, I didn't, ask, I didn't add one more benefit of inflation, right? About a third of all creditors to treasury debt are foreigners. They're sovereign wealth. Right, so we push the cost banks. onto them. Yeah, exactly. America first. I mean, have you heard of that? I mean, <laughs> come on, this works. <laughs> Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Neil Howe. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.